You're listening to Electrician Live with your host, Paul Abernathy. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Electrician Live. My name is Paul Abernathy, your host, as always. And before we get started, it is a call-in show. So if you'd like to call in, the number is scrolling across the top. Feel free to come in. And we will patch you in. Um, so, tonight's topic. Okay, well, first I should say, thanks everybody for taking the time out of your day. And I know I look like I have a tan. I didn't adjust it very well prior to the show. Sorry about that. But thank you for joining us. Uh, as you've probably seen, there's a lot of things that are going on through the week here at Electrician Live, as well as Electrical Code Academy. Um, you probably are... Are reading up on all of the posts and the tweets that we've done. A lot of great things are happening here. Um, so we thank you for, for joining us. Um, one of the things to, to kind of let you know about is our weekly chat. Is It used to be open every Wednesday night, uh, but now it's closing only to our subscribers that are in the uh, mid-tier, as well as our Fast Track students. Our exam prep is closing the door to that. So uh, we still have some public stuff, but again, the weekly uh, thing is going to be only for the fast track students as well as the mid level supporters uh, in our YouTube channel going forward. Doesn't mean we're not going to have other shows because we are. Just those are going to be dedicated just to the students who are trying to learn the National Electrical Code so that I can spend more dedicated time with the students and with people that are interested in learning the code. Now, Another thing you notice, people ask how they can donate to us and support all the stuff so we can keep making the free stuff as well. Well, we have a new way to do it on our website. If you go to masterthenec.com at the bottom, you'll see that we have a new mini screwdriver that has a bunch of different uh, bits in it. Uh, You can support us that way. And of course, we'll send you one of those, the official Electrical Code Academy Incorporated mini screwdriver as a thank you for your donation. Uh, That's just another way people ask how they can support the programs and help subsidize it, then that's one way to do it. Um, So um, other than that, um, we have some new stuff coming out for the paid members over on the YouTube channel. We're going to have the the update, the next edition of the Pool and Spa uh, video series is coming out again. And we have had an update to the 2020 NEC that just came out. So uh, as far as the video goes, we're ending up on 210. We're finally done with 210, so go check that out if you remember. Um, So thanks for coming to Electrician Live. We do this every week at 8 p.m. Central Central Standard Time. So make sure you join us for that. All right, so tonight's episode is dealing with the phenomena called phantom voltage, stray voltage, Spooky voltage. Been called many names. It has fooled many apprentices as well as a master uh, through the years. So we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. And I posted a video. If you, oh, I should mention over on our podcast. Again, you can come over and join us over on the video stream over at our youtube.com forward slash master the NEC. Or you can go over to electrician live. Dot com. Almost got choked up there over that. Kind of so emotional. So go over to electricianlive.com as well. You can you can actually watch it over there. Uh, but if you want to join in, kind of chime in uh, to the group, then come on over to our YouTube channel and you can join everybody here and, and, and chime in during the actual show. Okay, so phantom voltage. So this is a case, if you've ever been in a situation where you have a circuit that's, if you're reading it, you, you know that you have one that's dead, it's not on, but it's maybe in a raceway with other circuits, or, uh, or maybe it's a cable assembly that's being run in close proximity to another cable. One cable's energized and one is not, or it's disconnected. And you pick up some voltage, and you're sitting there wondering, what is this voltage? Now, now we're going to talk about the situation that happens with open neutrals, We're going to talk about phantom voltage and keep it with phantom voltage tonight, okay? But again, a lot of times, people can spend a lot of time really uh, chasing down this ghost, and there's really nothing there. Um, 
first thing I usually tell people when it comes to phantom voltage, and we'll look at a document here in a, uh, in a minute, but the first thing I tell people is if there's any load on it, then you realize real quickly that it, the, the, the voltage goes away. Uh, but it is a lot to do when you're reading it, if you're getting it, is the type of meter you're using. Okay, So we'll start out with that and kind of work our way around it because this show hopefully will have some call-ins. Again, if you have some weird stories or something that you know of that's taken you a long time to figure it out or you, you heard of an, an apprentice, um, actually the numbers uh, across the top is a number you can call into. Uh, and I'll tell you when you can call in if you want to call in. Right now, we'll just kind of go through the stories a little bit. Um, so the first story I'll tell you, and then we'll talk about the different why you get phantom voltage. Um, I guess it was back in probably 90, 91, 92. Uh, we had a situation of some uh, phantom voltage or, or ghost voltage uh, in an installation that I was working on. And I recognized it right away. Uh because it, it wasn't any, you know, it wasn't open neutral. It wasn't anything like that, that that was out of the normal. But we we were seeing these voltage readings, and I knew right away just off experience what it was. But I had a helper, and a helper was new, was just out of a, a apprenticeship, uh, real gung ho, great guy, and always positive. And so I noticed it on the meter, and so I asked him to check the circuit. And I gave him the voltmeter, which is a digital multimeter. It was a, a high impedance, a st- standard v- v- multimeter. And he was getting his voltages, and he was looking at it, and he said he knew the circuit. He had shut it off, and he was looking at it, yet it was, uh, however the circuit was run, it was inducing voltage over on the disconnected conductors. Uh, and he was doing his darndest to run around. He went, he would check, he'd go do this, he'd do that. And he could not figure out where this voltage, he could not remove it. And, you know, when he would turn everything off, it would be gone. He'd turn everything back on, he would get the voltage. And he said, this circuit is disconnected. And he would, he literally pulled it from the breaker and was still getting the voltage on it. And it was really just freaking him out. And so I kind of was busy doing something else, and and, it wasn't an overly busy day, so I didn't mind letting him uh, stress it out a little bit. And so I literally was funny, and I kind of wish now I had recorded it, just to watch him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And, of course, it was the stairs, so he had to go up and down, up and down, up and down. And, I mean, I bet he wore out them stairs. I bet you if you were to measure the amount of wood on those stairs after his day, that he had worn it down, just up and down. And, of course, I couldn't help but laugh every now and then, and he'd cut over and look at me, wondering whether or not he missed something funny, you know, like I had some some joke. And I had another guy that was with me as well, and I kind of told him what was going on. And we just watched him all day. So, again, it was our humor, our humor for the day. And I think I have some call-ins, but it's a little little early to call in. We're, we're, I'm not going to uh, start on the calls yet. So, uh, but anyway... That was the story, and we let the guy literally just work it out, work it out, back and forth, until finally he came to me. He says, Paul, I cannot figure out why I'm getting this voltage. I mean, the circuit is disconnected. I know nothing's plugged into it, and it was in a box with other circuits that were energized, but this one was not. And he he was totally not understanding what it was, and so I ended up, Finally, but I did wait a couple hours, and finally got to him, and we had a discussion about phantom voltage, you know, stray voltage, uh, and again, as a different topic, but since I had that opportunity, I was going to talk about stray voltage, swimming pool applications. I just spent the whole day talking about voltages, the, the afternoon, talking about voltages, whether it was phantom voltage, ghost voltage, and then we kind of went into what stray voltage is and, and all this and magnetic field. We went into a whole bunch of things on that day. Uh, but he finally walked away totally understanding what the issue was. Okay, so the problem was if he had grabbed a, a, a Wiggy, which is a solenoid type of uh, meter that actually would put load or allow load uh, on the system, then what he would have seen is that that would have caused the voltage to go away. And I, uh, we did have a Wiggy, but I wouldn't let him use it uh, because when I was testing it with my digital multimeter, 
I handed it to him because I wanted to set the stage so he would use it rather than a wiggy. And so he just, I was the owner, I mean, he just took the multimeter from me and started testing it, okay? And so <laughs> and so that it, it consumed quite a bit of the morning and into the early afternoon. I didn't tell him during lunch, but then in the afternoon we had a little set down and we talked about all those type of things. So, uh, so I did a video today, and it was a very short video, and I shared it on, I believe, my Instagram and I shared it also over on our Facebook page. And if you're not a member uh, of our Facebook page, uh, go join it, especially if you're preparing for an exam or you just want to join the Master the NEC, one where you can post questions and code and things like that, or you're preparing for an exam, check out Master the NEC's uh, Facebook page. Um, so anyway, I posted this little video, and it's a short video, but it, again, what it was was me just taking a 25-foot extension cord two of them, rolling them up together, plugging one in, and then the other end of it plugging to a lamp, uh, so give me some light, and then the other end was just uh, the prongs, and the other end, the uh, female end, was just there, not plugged into anything. And so I put the digital multimeter, which in this case, the AIMS, it was on, you know, testing with it, was a high impedance multimeter, like most of them are, and... It was reading around 4 volts. Now, you say 4 volts ain't much, but you got to remember, I'm just doing it at 25 feet and right there. So it was a crude test, but what it was showing you, the induced voltage from the extension cord with the power through it and the other one that's in close proximity. Now, you have to remember that of this extension cord, probably they're not really that close, even though they're rolled together depending on how the conductors are cabled in it, it probably is going to be a lot different if I were to run it inside of a metal raceway. Now, where we used to see most people get confused about phantom voltage, and we'll talk more detail about what it is, but what I used to see more people have problems with this is in industrial applications and commercial applications where the conductors in close proximity are being run in a raceway. And when they're running a raceway, of course, you have this expanding and collapsing magnetic field uh, doing the AC, change in direction, 60 times a second. So what happens is it induces voltage on conductors that are in really close proximity. And when you go to read it, you're going to read this amount of voltage. Now, a lot of times people think if you read this voltage, you're not going to read any hertz, which should be around 60 hertz, 59 or some give or take. Uh, but you do read hertz on most of them, even on the uh, induced voltage. So you can't use that. So at the end of the day, what you have is a high impedance multimeter, and most of the multimeters are that way. But now, today, you can buy low impedance multimeters. Now, the high impedance on the multimeter is essentially in a circuit measuring it to protect the meter. Um, and again, it's, it's kind of like not taking any load into consideration and purely reading the circuit. But then you have what's called a low impedance setting, which is allowing it to be low impedance, which is allowing it to be able to read an actual load based on, you know, low impedance, higher current, all those type of things. And the meter act actually represents an actual load. And so what happens is when you apply load to phantom voltage, it goes away. So it's not a usable voltage. It's not something that we can utilize. Uh, to do any actual work. Once you apply any load to this phantom voltage, it disappears. And so what happens is with the multimeters that have the low impedance setting, you flip it over to the low impedance setting, and all of a sudden you get a true reading value because it's a, a low impedance setting. So, again, um, it's going to go away. So if you have a voltmeter, uh, a digital multimeter that has a low impedance, then that's what you would use. Now, a couple things to, that I noticed during my test and I have through the years is we spend a lot of time relying on things like the voltage tickers that detect voltage. Now, the problem with those is that they can be activated as well when you're dealing with phantom voltage. And so I actually tested that today. Even though it was only 4 volts, it caused the detector to go off, say, and it was two different ty types that I tested. One was a very popular brand, 
and one was the one that's on the end of the AMs. And that was, again, phantom voltage. It can't do anything, but at the end of the day, uh, it did cause you to, to reading to go off on the voltage detector. And, and at that point, you don't know what it is. So you always want to assume it's hot. You always want to assume that you're dealing with the live uh, circuit. Uh, but, again, it can cause you to start chasing your tail around all over the building and run into problems. And so that is never a good thing to do or run into. So uh, you don't want to do it. And I was just checking real quick. And so, again, that's something that you you definitely don't want to run into and not know how to address it. So um, a couple things that I test all the time with it is, again, so in phantom voltage, I've checked hertz before. So I've done the same test with that 4 volts, turned it over to the hertz, and I still got 59.96 right at 60 hertz. So it didn't affect it any or didn't actually uh, can use a meter that measures hertz and think that you can use that to detect whether or not there's any actual voltage there. Uh, but what you did notice, what I did notice is the moment that you applied any load, the phantom voltage just immediately goes away. And that's essentially what a low impedance meter is doing. It's a replicating an application applying a load, and then it just dissipates off and you get the actual true reading. So digital multimeters will throw you. Now, if you have an analog meter or if you had the wiggy with the solenoid meter, they are going to give you true readings. Okay, now they're not as sophisticated, they don't have all the bells and whistles, but again, if you're old school electrician, you know that it ain't nothing better than a good old wiggy. And it can basically, when somebody's detecting that voltage and they're freaking out, then all of a sudden you can turn around and go to this and a wiggy and boom, you know. Or if you have a low impedance meter that has a setting on it, then you can do that as well. Now, the high impedance meters that I have, the flukes and... Um, the aims, um, you just have to know what you're reading and the values you're reading to get an understanding of it, okay? Um, the other thing to do is I have always an applicator. Well, I used to have it. I don't anymore, but it's a little light that allows me to clamp on. It has insulated alligator clips that a lot of times back in the day, since we knew phantom voltage would, would die under a load, is that we would click onto it. We put a little lamp on it, and it replicate a load, and all of a sudden, the light wouldn't light up, and we were detecting voltage, but we knew it wouldn't do anything. That told us it was phantom voltage, right? So, so if if you if you think that you've got some readings, and it looks like the readings are 30, 60, 80, and sometimes it can be close to as high, depending on how long the cable or conductors are, and how close proximity. That again, inside of a ferrous metal raceway, for example, it could magnify the effect, and you could end up getting this induced voltage from the conductors that are connected to the conductor that's not. Now, I've been talking about this for years when it comes to MEG testing, when you're dealing with capacitance and your in inductive coupling, because that's what I believe we're talking about here is inductive coupling, not necessarily a capacitance coupling. However, once you disconnect it, I believe there are capacitance that maintain a certain level of, of it inside the actual conductor until it dissipates. Um, but the real issue here is, is due to inductive coupling. So you've got the current that's running through the magnetic field, expanding, collapsing in one conductor, and it induces it over onto the other, and it's not even connected. So when you're doing MEG testing, for example, if you have something like that, typically you're hooking a mega up and you're sending a charge through it uh, and you're running it for 60 seconds, in some cases even 10 minutes, depending on whether you're doing a polarization index test. And it can induce a level of voltage over on a mutual conductor. So a lot of times you dissipate the one, but you don't think about the one you haven't tested yet. And you should always dissipate before you test the second conductor. And I don't think people do that all the time. We're always taught to go A to B, B to C, A to C, ground, but I don't Thing in the in the in the um, megs, they end up discharging themselves. But what about the mutual conductors that are in there? You have to think about discharging them really quickly, and it's a simple step, but it should be done because sometimes you can get poor readings if you don't do that. Um, so, um, but I have seen people chase that ghost all over the place 
when it comes to the phantom voltage. Now, interesting enough, um, I used to work for NEMA, and I guess quite a few years ago, NEMA put out a document from the manufacturers that tried to explain phantom voltage. So I figured we would check that out, and let's see if we can uh, see what that looks like. So here's the bulletin. And as you can see, this bulletin is all the way. Okay, now those over on the actual uh, podcast, I'm going to read it to you. But those that have the stream or over here on our YouTube channel, you can see it on the screen. But I'm going to read it anyway. Uh, And it was put out in 1998. It was revised in 2003. And it was reaffirmed in 2011. Again, nothing's changed with phantom voltage. Now, NEMA put out this on behalf of the members, and it says, This bulletin is intended to address the occurrence of so-called phantom voltage, a phenomenon detected detected during the testing of electrical conductors in the field. It says, Due to high impedance of measuring instruments, again, the high impedance meters is typically what we utilize when we're using a typical DMM. And so you can get them now, Fluke and a lot of FLIRs, and they will make a setting that is a low impedance setting. But typically, all of your meters, even your older ones, are going to be high impedance. Okay? It says, a voltage reading may be detected on open conductors where there is no hard electrical connection to the voltage source. Okay? And it's kind of like the video that I did today where I actually had... um, bring me up here, where I actually had the extension cord on top of each other, one plugged in, one was not, and I was getting four volts. And again, this is just over a little 25 foot, and they weren't even probably really close together. They were probably still pretty far apart when you think of how the conductors are run inside the cable. So extension cord. So um, they're going to be much closer in a raceway where this can be more prominent. Okay, and it's going to be also something that's going to be more prominent inside of, let's say, a 14.3 or a 12.3, where you might get one conductor that's not connected on each end. Maybe it's the red, and all of a sudden you're getting this voltage, but it's not what you think it is, and you start to get all freaky on it and realize what is going on, and you start running around thinking this is loose or that's loose or whatnot. So if you haven't run into phantom voltage in your career, you will. It's just a matter of time. All right, now. It says, conductors that are installed in close proximity to another one and are capacitively coupled to each other. Now, I'll argue whether or not capacity is the only thing going on here. Uh, It says, can cause this AC voltage reading. Such a reading could be 2 to 3 volts. In my case, it was 4 volts, and that was only on 25 feet. I have seen this voltage be much, much higher much higher, depending on the severity uh, of, of the installation, much higher than two to three volts. I believe that NEMA probably be better served to update this document. Now, it says, or it may be as high as the voltage on the adjacent conductors. Okay, well, they start with two to three, but then they, they bring it back. Okay, so maybe they're okay. Just reaffirm this thing. Okay, this is referred to as phantom voltage. According to Underwriters Laboratory, This can be harmless reading and can be caused by the high input impedance of the measuring instrument, which places very little loading on the circuit under test. This is true. And it says the capacitance is increased as the length of run is increased. So I would have gotten more if my extension cords were much longer. Now, what's interesting is maybe I'm going to do a test and this is funny. Maybe I'll take two, two reel, because obviously I have access to wire, right? Maybe I'm going to take two 500 reel, foot reels of, let's say, 12-2. Oh, no, let's type 12. Let's say 12 gauge, uh, black and white. And I'm going to take them and, and connect them together for the entire 500 feet. So I have one big spool of a black and a white conductor right next to each other, parallel for the entire length. Then I'm going to apply... Uh, some voltage to the black, and I bet that I get a a very high reading, if not close to the reading on the white than I have the black. Probably going to get a pretty darn good reading, right? So, um, again, so that's what we're doing. This. So now it says the capacitance is increased as the length of run is increased, okay? And I like to call this in, in, an induced voltage 
from one conductor to another conductor based on proximity to each other. It says, a 50-foot run may produce a pronounced capacitance effect, whereas a one-foot sample may not produce any. And as you saw today, if you watched my little video, um, I've got four volts, and they weren't even really close. It's just two extension cords laying on top of each other. And I was able to induce voltage over on the, the extension cord that isn't plugged into anything. Okay? So, since the phantom voltage is a physical phenomenon involving very small values of capacitance, it cannot energize a load or cause physiological damage to a person. Okay? It's harmless, but it does freak with your mind. Okay? Now, it says care must be taken to be sure that the voltage reading is indeed phantom voltage, which is caused by improper use of a high impedance multimeter. Now, I'm not going to say it's an improper use. Um, you're going to get this reading with the multimeter anyway because it is based on high impedance. But if it has a low impedance setting, then you can turn it down and to the low impedance setting and you should be able to totally mitigate the issues with the high impedance. Now, there's plenty of meters with this setting on it already. If you have a high impedance meter, then you just have to understand and the easiest way to be able, if you're still old school and you have the meter, is go with the solenoid type like a Wiggy or an analog meter um, rather than a digital meter. Have, always have one handy. But the other thing you could do is actually try to, and I used to, like I said, I used to have one of those light bulbs, an actual light bulb with the, with the, 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 um, the little uh, stems on it, the black and the white that we use for like temporary construction. And I put alligator clips on the end of it. And I used to put that on them. Again, when I was testing it, and again, if it didn't light the lamp, then I knew that it was phantom voltage, even though I was getting voltage there. But it gets a lot, so you probably just could have easily just had a wiggy or something else, and I always did have a wiggy. So you remember when I was teasing my helper, we had a wiggy. I just wouldn't let him use it because I gave him the digital multimeter right away because I wanted him to use that and think that I was, you know, I wasn't like I was setting him up, but you know what I mean. Okay, now it says and not as a result of a cable defect or improper insulation, which may result in a shock. So you have to know that it's phantom voltage and always assume that it's hot. Now, like I said, the little voltage sniffers, the little tickers, they can be activated as well from this because it is voltage. It just doesn't have any work to it. It doesn't have any ability to, to do anything, but it will cause those tickers to go off. Okay, So you have to be aware of that. Now, in order to help minimize the likelihood of reaching a wrong conclusion from this phenomenon, NEMA recommends the use of a listed low impedance multimeter in place of a high impedance multimeter or other high impedance measuring device for testing on open conductors where there is no hard electrical connection without a low impedance de measuring device. A high voltage reading is an inconclusive indication of possible faults in the cable. Okay, so this all comes from NEMA. I'll come back to me. So this is that's just a document that um, when uh, that, that was put out by NEMA, and it's been reaffirmed every couple years, and it gets reaffirmed again. The phenomenon doesn't go away, and it is why you read these things. Now, again, uh, I saw a. Mo uh, a a new meter, I don't know how new it is, that Fluke, and I'm not here to promote Fluke, but I'm saying they have meters, and I also saw one from, I want to think Sperry, or I can't remember the name, but they also, most all of them now will have a low impedance, uh, a low Z setting on it. Uh, but again, I'm old school, I still use a high impedance, but I'm kind of familiar with what I'm looking at, and the process of, oh, that's phantom voltage, uh, I know what I'm dealing with. But I always make sure, okay, those type of things. So one of the way I know is if it's a circuit I'm dealing with and it's disconnected and it's in close proximity, maybe sharing a raceway with another, uh, that I know that the you know I could probably rest assured the values that I'm getting that it's phantom voltage when I check all the others and everything's normal and then this one's not. Um, but again, better safe than sorry, and I always carry an extra a wiggy with me. Now, if it's a known connected circuit, then high impedance meters are fine. Okay, it's only when you know you've disconnected something and you start to scratch your head 
then that's when you want to say, okay, timeout. This is probably phantom voltage. Now, the reason that you don't want to go all the way there yet, jump in deep, is because you could have an open neutral and you're reading that or, or something like that. So you have to do a little work. But again, uh, it's not, uh, if you've never run into this phantom voltage situation, then you're, you will. It's a matter of time. Now, I used to run into them again the most when we were doing, my brother were doing uh, commercial applications in long raceways that had multiple uh, branch circuits in the raceways. Then that's when we would be have a circuit at the other end and we have it off and the circuits go to a junction box and it breaks off and and we were getting voltage there and we're going, wait a minute, that circuit's off. We know it's off. Okay, and it was, again, we kind of knew that it was uh, Phantom Bolton. And by the way, that helper after a couple of years wasn't with me anymore because I would have kind of teased him. I know he didn't leave because of that. So he had an opportunity. Once he got he got his license, he, uh, he went to work with his family because they owned electrical contracting. He wanted him to work with me for a couple of years, and I was happy with that and taught him everything that I could. And then he went on with his uh, family and, and their electrical business, and he's doing great today. Still electrician. Uh, in fact, a master now and doing wonderful. Uh, but he'll always remember that day where I just let him run around for about four and a half, five hours trying to find out why this circuit was like that. Okay. All right. So now if anybody has any, um, I have a couple other stories, but if anybody has any stories um, they want to call in and tell us about their experience, feel free to call in now. The number's on the line. If it, if it uh, for some reason doesn't go through, then just keep trying back, and I'll get you connected. Sometimes this thing works, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, but, uh, yeah, there's all kinds of stories on this application. And, again, the real issue is close proximity. So I've got the one conductor that has current running through it at some load. It uh, has the voltage, and then I have a close conductor that isn't connected, and I have what we call a uh, coupling effect that takes place. Um, not so different than what happens with the transformer. Again, I hate, I hesitate to go there, but again, there is a there is a separation between the two, and the only reason that you're actually getting anything over onto that other conductor is because of the coupling effect that takes place. Okay. And so that's how we get it. But, I mean, I have had uh, my personal experiences also in some older homes uh, and where people were back in the day, they were doing a lot of cable bundling and then not necessarily following the code and getting readings when we have bundles of cables and having something that's disconnected. So let's see, we have a caller. To accept, press 1. Send a voice. Hey, caller, you on the air? Hey, how you doing? All right, who are we talking so, to? Who are we talking to? This is this is Xavier. Xavier, I had messaged earlier talking about the ninety volt the phantom bar, uh, phantom voltage I dealt with yesterday. Oh, okay. You so, you uh, just recently had an issue just just yesterday. Just yesterday, um, I have a, a real estate friend of mine. He um. You know, he, he just got a whole acquired property and had some electricians rewire it. It's actually, licensed electricians, um, you know, and on. Um, and what was happening was the dishwasher receptacle was pulling, was showing 90 volts. Um, actually, 92 to be exact to have a picture of it. So, uh, you know, I, he called me because they said they were going to have to tear down walls and all. And he, you know, he had other problems he had before. Now, I dealt with him with it. You know, minimum intrusive work on it. So, you know, I got over there and I checked it with the meter. Yeah, 92 volts. That's what he told me. I plug in a lamp, I get nothing. No light, regular incandescent bulb. I plug in another one. So, you know, I should have checked it with the load. My thing was, I'm thinking, my first thought was a staple. I dealt with that back in 2005 to get trained. Somebody rammed a staple halfway through. I um, 10 gauge on back to seven, one of the legs, and I was getting 110. On one leg and about a hundred and one on the other. Right. But um, you know, it, it, it couldn't even light up a light bulb that time of day. So um. Yeah. So the key. So the so the key. So the key here was in that last experience, it still was able to carry the load and light a lamp. But in this case, as I said, once you put load to phantom voltage, 
you're not going to get any light out of it. So you you did the right thing right away is plugging a lamp into the receptacle because it didn't work. So did that tell you right away it was phantom or did you have to do some more? Well, you know, that thing, you know, I had my suspicions at that point. I had dealt with phantom bars in an industrial setting. I mean, with the phantom bars, phantom voltage in an industrial setting. So, um, you know, never that high, though, at 90 volts. But, you know, the guy in his road map, it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, a dwelling. So, family dwelling in it. And it's road max, and, um, you know, I kind of thought that could be odd to get that on road max. So, you know, I kind of checked all the receptacles over down the countertop, and I was getting no voltage on a DFI. I pulled a DFI off. Well, the DFI was in a, um, in, in, a, in a state, in a trip state. But it had, it, it was reading the 90 voltage on there when I pulled it off on the back. So I couldn't get nothing to the front. So um, what happened was I noticed it had a red wire. There was a red wire coming through it. And this is all room mess. I go to the panel. I take the cover off. There's no red wire. So immediately it got, you know, got me thinking, you know, what was the deal on um, but, but So what was happening was you mentioned something about seeing it in the 12, it was a 12-3 mm-hmm. wire. They ran. It was sharing neutral. They ran the black um the black pot to the to the living room, and then this one went to the kitchen and to the dishwasher on the red sir on the red side. So coming out the panel, I don't know why they did this, but they had two twelve gauge wires, each one having a separate breaker. They went into a little junction box in the attic, tied together, one neutral completely eliminated, and then it was. A twelve three, and it split off. I don't know why and what in the world I was thinking. Maybe they were gonna do something different. I don't know, but um, but that that was the problem then. And without pulling walls, basically I went through. I pulled the receptacles. I tied the neutrals and gave tapes on a you know um, pigtails on all my neutrals, so no neutral could get separated. I went back and I moved the two two breakers next to each other, and I put me in a. Uh, um, a, a double fold breaker. Good. The way it could trip, and I marked it Good. as a multi wire circuit. I think that was the biggest thing I could do for them without tearing any walls down. But yeah, that, that, but that's what was called though. Because the living room was getting that power um, off of the, the one leg of the um, 12 3, and the kitchen dishwasher was trying to get it off the red one, you know, even though it was open at the time. You know, you you uh you you probably describing what I would say m- most people would find as a phantom voltage situation is something like I was saying a, a twelve to a twelve three or fourteen three where it's sharing a neutral, but you've got one circuit you think it's turned off. And again, you bring up a great point. There's other reasons why on multi wire brand circuits we use two pole breakers or two single poles with identified handle ties. Because of this exact reason, somebody, if there was two singles in there, somebody turned off one, yet the other circuit was still energized, and you know as well as I do, you can get just as good a shock off a neutral as you can an ungrounded conductor. So it's a unsafe condition, and you, were, and you were able to make it safe and make it right. I don't know why people keep cutting corners and doing the, the code is a minimum standard, and you made it safe, so that was awesome. But, yeah, I can see where... If you didn't know all this, then somebody could start opening up walls, ripping things out, getting freaking out over it. Yeah, and you're dealing, like you said, with that neutral, you know. And, you know, I, just out of past experience, I always, I, I, I got my best my best little zap off of a neutral, off that ground and conductor before. So I, I'm always careful to always treat those just as much as I treat the, um, the regular conductor. I'll treat my ground and conductor the same off. You know, until I know otherwise. Until I know it's completely dead, it's going to be treated like it's a hot one. Because, um, you know, and in that case, you know, like that, I mean, that, that's so easy to just go in there because you know the break is off. I could have pulled it off, touched it, fans running in the living room and all, taking that neutral, you know, and, and, and bringing that load back on that neutral and getting a little tank, you know, a little zap that I didn't need to get. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you, I'm exactly right. But, yeah, that was the best approach I could say to it. But, I mean, but there's one reason I tell you what, in electrical field, I tell you don't. I, I always learn from my past experience, but when I look at something and I think it's similar, I try not to focus. I don't focus my mind on that one last thing because I know it could be something different. Because, you know, I, I was thinking Romex safe for first. 
And that was my first thought in my mind. I could have went with that thinking, hey, somebody stapled into the Romex because I've seen that on a dryer circuit. But I was getting I was getting like 112 off one side. I was getting like 107 or 101 actually on the other on the other leg. And when I the walls were still down, so as I walked and traced the 10 gauge wire, I seen that they hit they clipped it with a staple. And in that case, when I put the lamp on one leg, it was bright. When I put the lamp on the other leg, it was bright for a second, then it would dim down. All right, that's your that's your that's your that's your neutral issue there. So you were able to. A lot of times, that's what we see when we have a load where the lamp is really, really, really bright uh, on one. That tells us that it is an open neutral or a a problematic neutral. And we see this a lot in, in recess cans that really burn really bright and eventually burn out. It's because there's a neutral connection issue. So, But in this case, what would have been interesting is if you had to use the voltage ticker and, uh, you know, people rely on those things. And, again, I used to sell quite a few of them things, and I have them. But, I mean, I am more than sure that that ticker would have started just going off like crazy, even on your your 90-volt phantom voltage issue. I bet it would have detected it as if it was voltage. Now, can you imagine if somebody didn't have your experience, an apprentice or a helper or a, somebody new in the trade? How many... I mean, can you charge the people? Oh, yeah. Can you charge the people for three or four hours of you running around and only to find out it's just phantom voltage? And boy, you're going to look embarrassed. Now, obviously, the customer is not going to know any different. But I mean, how do you charge somebody for three hours of of you having to learn on the job? It's it can be tough. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, and um, I tell you, and that's, that's when you talk about the meter. I, I'm in the habit of of checking something with my meter. I also checked it with the ticker, and you know, within that time, yeah, my ticker actually went off on it, like you said. And, um, but, uh, you know, and then when I'm really in doubt, I'm going to put a lamp on it with a bulb I know. Yeah. And once I check it on that circuit, I'm going to another circuit to make sure it was still working. And that, that right there, out of those three things, I got, I, I would usually have an absolute answer. You know? But, yeah, I mean, it could be, because, you know, it's something scary. Uh, it would be a tiny bulb, and I'm sitting there thinking, well, I don't want to just touch this. <laughs> right, you know? right. And, um, I don't. I don't want to grab it. It know, says hey, ninety volts on it. <laughs> exactly, and without a proper procedure, and you might sit there and spend a lot of time trying to figure out why it's there. Uh, I can, yeah, you know, I completely understand that. I mean, I, it, unfortunately, in this case, it took me only about twenty minutes to figure out what was going on. But um, I can see how I could easily take someone quite some time. Um, especially if you didn't have the concept of how it was working. Right. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I appreciate your show today, though. I mean, that's, that's one thing you mentioned is I just dealt with it yesterday. Uh, that's what. Yeah. So one of our members uh, that are in the video, uh, Robbie, says, "Can I explain open neutral?" Uh, basically, you know, in a, in a normal AC circuit, it, it changes directions sixty times a second, and in, in in this concept, when you have an open neutral, um, it can't fluctuate back and forth so what happens is that the voltage uh, will it doesn't allow it for it to get accurate readings on the neutral because it's open but in some cases because of how you're doing a measurement the actual voltage can be higher on the ungrounded conductor and this is what causes a lot of the the lamps to really really get all of a sudden really bright before it burns out and open neutrals you just have to be, you know, if you start noticing some funky, funky voltages on on the hot leg, then and you're not getting any readings from the hot leg over to the neutral, but you get a reading from the hot leg over to an equipment ground, for example, uh, then it can tell you that you have an open neutral. So I always tell people, again, check hot to neutral and then check hot to ground. And people say, why do I do that? Well, because back at the main panel, the grounds and the neutrals do come together on the same terminal bus, so you should be able to get the reading. Uh, and then you can tell if your reading on your neutral is a little messed up uh, in your reading. So, um, but thanks, Xavier. Thanks for the the story. It, again, that could have turned into a nasty situation that ate up a lot of time. But it sounds like your experience kind of helped you know what it was right away. Yeah, right away. Like you said, the industrial experience. I kind of, uh, you know. I was thinking phantom voltage, but I was being that high, 
like you said, 90 volts. But when you was reading that reading and, and you start out saying the two to vault, four volts or whatever at first, I'm like, no way. No, go a little lot higher. And then you finish it. So, yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. That's the first time I've seen one that high. Yeah, I mean, like my example today, that was just an extension cord, and they weren't really coupled close together. Um, unlike in your case, man, that's a, you know, a, what was it? A, did you say it was a 10-3 or a 12-3? It was a 12-3. Okay, 12-3. Yeah. You know, those conductors are running in close proximity for, you know, a, a long length of uh, run. You don't know what the length would be. Uh, in a non-metallic sheath cable in a, in a dwelling, going up and through studs and through top plates and, I mean, it could be 40, 50, 60, 75 feet overall. So, again, close exactly. proximity. Now, if they were a little further apart, you might have less induced coupling effect. But those, because they're in the same cable and they're cabled together, they're plexed, then what happens is it's in extremely close proximity, uh, proximity, and that's going to read, and that's why you're going to get a higher value. Now, if you did this in a Ferris Raceway and you had a bunch of circuits uh, inside of a raceway in industrial and you're doing motors and you got one of the legs undone and then you're you're reading something and you could totally freak out and get in such high voltages and you're like what is going on here because a lot of times they have larger raceways that are going to share multiple circuits so it could really freak you out you know and you know when i thought about one of the things that i really considered about that high voltage zone I was all the way on the other side of the house from the panel. Mm-hmm. Um, I consider that I was testing on my grounding conductor right there by the load, next on the part of the load before I got back to the panel. I'm on the pressure. If I was close to the panel, I may not have raised such a high voltage because that, you know, that neutral load it, that was part of the that neutral I was checking with was part of the load, you know, of that twelve three. So um, I think that's that could have contributed to that high voltage reading I was getting as as it, because I'm so far away from where the ground the conductor well, actually gets the, 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 the phantom voltage, the, the values that you're going to read are very indicative of length. The longer you go and the longer the close proximity takes place, the better chance you're going to get the higher readings. So, yes, you probably might not get... Now, interesting enough, when I was testing my little extension cord today... I was testing the end that was close to the end that plugged into the receptacle, and I was still getting on either one of them. I was getting right about four volts either end. So on on the cord. So, but it is true statement. If you were to test the system at seventy five feet away, you would get diff- possibly different values than you would get up close. But the the, the issue is, it always seems to be the issue is at the load anyway, at the at the end where the switches are, where the receptacles are. But the first thing that you did that I tell people all the time, if it's in a receptacle you're getting this, plug a load in it and see if it lights the load, if it, it just the lamp, see if it lights the lamp. Like I said, I have my little lamp with my little leads with an alligator clips on them, insulated clips that I used to use when I'd get the, when we would get this at, switch locations and things like this. I'd have the hot. I'd take the hot there, connect one over uh, to the neutral, and I would see whether or not I'm getting anything. And it wouldn't light it up, then I wasn't getting it. Then I knew it was phantom voltage. Um, but, again, different different ways to do it. Of course, the easiest way today is, is to have a setting on your meter that's just a low, low, vo- uh, a low um, uh, impedance setting, and then you don't, and you don't have to worry about it. Or get you a wiggy, solo, a solenoid type meter or analog meter, and then then they will work fine. It's the it's the digital multimeters with the high impedance. They're the ones that detect this. So um, I don't want to throw all of them out with the bathwater, right? Because they still fine as long as it's a system that you know the power's on and everything's connected and the breakers are on. They work fine. It's only when you have yep. open connections that that high impedance is not going to do you any favors, that type of thing. Yeah. Well, All man. Right. I well, appreciate you. Having- well, thank you for calling, man. I'm glad uh, you could tell us your story. That sounds awesome. I'm, I'm glad you fixed it for him. That's the, that's the key. But uh, 
I also, yeah, I also uh, like the fact that you fixed it and put the uh, two pole breaker on it, or, or again, two, since it's a multi wire brand circuit, you were able to, to to make it right, and that's that's something that needed to be done. A lot of people wouldn't try to wouldn't make it right, and you made it right, so that's good. Yeah, the only thing I didn't like about it was was having the kitchen and um, you know, in the the living room sharing at twelve three. But hey. I mean, you know, I, I I don't see a code violation. So the way it was done, I mean, not that I can think of. So I, I mean, I, next to the, the next thing could be done with tearing that wall. So yeah. So the only thing that would be code for that would be, for example, that now a multi-wire brand circuit is two circuits. It's sharing a neutral, but it's it qualifies as two separate brand circuits. One of them was doing the dishwasher. One is doing a living room. Um, the only issue that you'd run into is somebody said, well, that dishwasher is designed to get a dedicated circuit. In reality, we could argue and say that there, it was a dedicated circuit because a multi-wire is two circuits, still not the optimum way to run that circuit. So, but it is what it is. And at this case, I would have done the same thing you is, there's no way that I'm going to argue that it has to come out or be changed. It's already in there. It's, Technically, two separate circuits. Just put it on a multi-wire. You know, just put it on a two-pole breaker or two single poles with identified handle tie, and and make sure it's labeled properly, and move on. Yeah, and that's what I did. So I'm glad you agree with me on that. Yep. Yeah. No. I, no, I man, Xavier. No, I don't agree. Go rip it all out. Open up the walls. Pull it all down. No, don't do that. It's all good. Uh, I can I, I like to see my customers that. Yeah, I mean, we all have to. We all have to live with our conscience too. It's no. It it's two separate circuits, it's two separate overcurrent devices. Yet sharing neutral, understanding how multi wire brand circuits work. It should not. You know, obviously not going to overload the neutral. Um, so, you know, it it's going to work fine. And it is what it is. It's already in. So just you know, go. You made it as safe as you can make it. Well, All thanks, right. Paul. I appreciate you having me on. Hey, man. Nice. Thank you for calling in. Call yeah. in any time. I will. I will. All right. Take care. Have a night. You too. Bye bye. Yeah. All right. Well, Xavier, thanks for calling in. That was awesome. So that was a great example of, and, and Xavier did the right things here. Okay. A lot of times we walk into these situations and we're just there as a a service call. And theoretically, it's two small appliance. No, sorry. It's two branch circuits. And again, as long as it's on a two pole breaker or two single pole with identified handle tie, what are you going to do? And again, we get these calls all the time and and you're not going to say, oh, well, you got to rip it all out. You're not. Okay. Theoretically, whether something was right or wrong, it is safe as it's going to be if you protect it properly. And then it sounds like Xavier did the exact same thing that, that, that I would have done in that situation. So no way I'm going to make the customer open up anything or even argue that he should open up anything. Okay? Not at all. Now, some people don't like shared neutrals. Code allows for it. Code compliant. Like it or not is what it is. I ran myself uh, quite a few of these common type of common neutral circuits. When we do bedrooms, I'd run a 14-3 to the back, and one would do one bedroom, one would do the other. The black would do that one. Red would do that one. Shared a neutral, never had a problem. Code allows me to do it. It can be treated as a single brand circuit, or it can be treated as two brand circuits. Okay? All right. See if we have uh, any questions that we have in the room. For those that are over on the podcast, again, thank you all for listening on the podcast. Uh, Hopefully you check us out over on our video stream. Again, we do this every week. Uh, And then when you want to check what the topic is in advance, just go to electricianlive.com and it will have an update. Now, I have a special show coming for the July 4th edition. So, again, it's probably not up there. Um, But... uh, We are, yes, July 4th does fall on the day where we do Electrician Live. So I believe we're going to still have a show. It'll always be recorded, so you can watch it later. 
Uh, and if you're in the podcast, uh, I, again, appreciate you listening to us over on Deezer, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, uh, Apple Tunes, Apple iTunes, whatever you call it, Google Play, uh, all those type of platforms. I do appreciate you listening. All right, let's see what we've got here in the board. We've got Matthew says the first meter he ever owned was a solenoid type wiggy. Absolutely, me too. Me too, Matthew. I still own it. Still love it. It's simple, but I will say I only pull it out of the bag uh, when I need it for uh, if I'm detecting anything like uh, uh, dealing with a uh, phantom voltage. Other than that, I always tell people if you have a high resistance, remember a key thing to remember. If you think you've got phantom voltage or something seems wonky, put it under load. And so if you're at a switch or even at a receptacle, even at the receptacle, you could take a lamp, and again, it has the two leads on it that I actually can plug into the receptacle, okay? And if it won't light the lamp, it's phantom voltage, okay? It's just plain and simple. Um, So... Kind of one of the ways that we would do it if you still have the high impedance meters. If not, get you a low impedance one that'll work fine. Uh, again, the ones that I display, like the Ames, doesn't have that setting. Um, but again, it's okay for me because, again, I still have a backup wiggy. Now, anything else that I would do where power is always on and I know it's on and I'm just checking the voltage, then I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not worrying about the value. I'm worrying about actually getting the voltage value. And so in that case... I don't mind using a digital multimeter because I can get those values out of it. Plus, I use it, you know, clamp on amp probe and, and hertz measurements to make sure the hertz are right, which they should be anyway, but to test it. Uh, all those type of things, I love a digital multimeter. So, again, one small benefit would be if it had a low impedance setting on it, but a lot of the meters you probably have today, the newer ones you get, are probably going to have that setting on it, okay? So, that was a lot of great information in this show. Um, let's see here. What is Robbie? Oh, let's see here. Jeff says, look up ideal 61065. That is one I have. Okay. Um, it's an ideal meter. I assume that that, uh, Jeff has a low impedance setting on it for this same situation. Uh, Robbie said, so an open neutral is dangerous because you could assume the circuit is off, but it, really isn't. That is one of the issues with it, definitely. Um, anything. One thing to remember is that you can't, generally we can't switch a neutral. And you can't put fuses in neutrals. Uh, this is the general rule. So kind of one of those things that you could have a neutral that actually looks like it's dead and current could be, uh, you could have the ability to have it continue carry a load up to the point where your neutral is lost. And so somebody thinks it's a neutral and comes in contact. So you always treat the neutral just like you would treat a hot, okay? But you're going to get some weird readings if you have an open neutral, okay? And so not the same readings. It's not the same characteristics you're going to get with the uh, phantom voltage because an open neutral could be not all the way broken, and you're still going to get, you're still going to probably get some readings from if you were to go from the ungrounded to the ground, uh, or you know, again, you might not get something if it's an open neutral from the hot over to the neutral, but you still have potential for for a uh, uh, dangerous situation there definitely with an open neutral. So, again, one of the procedures that I go through if I thought it was an open neutral is I go right to the panel and I check all of my connections to make sure they're all properly done, everything's torqued fine. And then when I'm getting circuits that aren't working, um, but I know it's plugged in and the breakers and everything's working, then I start looking for where I might have an issue with an open neutral. But phantom voltage is a totally different thing, whereas we don't have any apparent issue in the circuits. We've disconnected a circuit, and it's not connected at each end, And we're still getting a voltage reading. That shouldn't happen. Obviously, it's not connected to a breaker. But it's getting this induced voltage. And again, it can't do any work. It's harmless. Except it will play on the mind and make you think you have to do some other type of testing. And it could cause you to just run around, run around, run around. So that's why, again, have a wiggy. 
have something solenoid based, an anal, uh, analog type of meter. Save your digital me- multimeter for other readings. Uh, and for normal load testing, receptacle, power, it's fine. It's just when you know that you've disconnected something and you know you've turned it off and you're still getting a voltage reading. Now you know why you're probably getting it. And there's a couple ways that we talked about to, to be able to, to test it. Okay. An open neutral can be an open totally. And it could cause a circuit not to run at all because the neutral is loose. Or it could be a circuit that is loose neutrals and they're not making a really good connection and they're arcing. And so you'll get intermittent applications. All right. So you could, and you could get a circuit that functions, but the lights would go really, really bright. And it would kind of tell you that something's going on with that connection. Okay, so just kind of something you have to investigate. Maybe we'll do a show all about open neutrals and and all of the situations, everything that can happen with an open neutral. Maybe we'll do another show on that. Uh, But again, if I have a black and a white and the neutral is truly open, then the circuit's not going to complete. Okay, but that's not usually where we have the problems with the open neutrals. We usually have a problem with us calling them open neutrals, but it's just a poor connection neutral. That would be where we're getting some ap- applications. And then under load, you can have arcing take a place across a neutral that is broken only because it's indicative of a load that's being drawn. So you have no problem with it until you plug a load in. And then the load creates enough current draw that it causes it to arc over that gap. And so it sounds like it's a great show and we need to do one on open neutrals and all of the issues with open neutrals. If that's what you folks want, Let me know what you want to hear on future uh, shows. Right here is the email address for those that are on the podcast. It's info, I-N-F-O, at masterthenec.com. That's our website right there, masterthenec.com, .net or .org. It doesn't really matter. Go to any of those you want. And send us your feedback. Send us your topics for future shows. If you know somebody in an industry that you'd like to see on this show, um, maybe I'll get somebody in the PV industry on the show. Uh, people have been asking me for PV stuff, so maybe we got to do that. So anyway, that is it for tonight's show here at Electrician Live. I thought it was a great show about phantom voltage. Gave you some tips on how to detect it. Just be careful with it. And for those over in the podcast, we're going to end the podcast. For those over in the video stream, I'll hang around and answer a few more questions while we transition from the podcast over to the live stream, okay? So just hang tight, those that are in the video, and we will uh, pick it up here shortly. Oh, wrong one, right? (laughs) You've been listening to Electrician Live with your host, Paul Abernathy.